Well, we're standing in the Bob and Ray Sports Spotlight right now because one of our old friends is here in town this week, and very timely, too, since football is just around the corner. The head coach of the team at Indiana Collegiate University, Spike Sturdley. And, uh, Spike, a real warm welcome is yours from Ray and myself as we see you once again for another season. How you doing, fans? How are things at ICU this year? Well, I think things are looking up. Uh, we had a shock here when I uh, sent out the call for first practice. I only had seven men show up. A little short of a full team, huh? That's right. So uh, with a couple of little Shanghai jobs around there, we got a pretty uh-huh. adequate squad of uh, 22 men now. Is your son going to be playing on the team with you this year? Yeah, Oliver, yes. yes. He's going to be uh, quarterback in the team. He's a great little thinker, and I like the way he calls plays, and uh, he works well out of the tee, and uh, he can hit a dime with a football. He's a great passer. Well, Spike, now last year, your season wasn't all that uh, could have been uh, expected. No. Uh, uh, by that, I mean, I don't think you won any games, did you? That's right, Bob. Uh, last year was one of those years that just seems to happen to us almost every year. What was the reaction of the faculty and the uh, school board when ICU came up with a completely... Uh, uh, Poor team. Well, of course, they, uh, everyone likes to have a winning team represent them down there on the gridiron. Well, I think uh, most of the complaints came from uh, most of the older graduates. The alumni uh, agitated quite a bit for my scalp. Well, of course, years back, ICU was unbeatable. And then when you came to the school, the record, of course, began going downhill, and it's been going ever since. More or less coincided with my taking over the head coach activities out there at ICU that uh, their football... Uh, uh, yeah. Well, wasn't part of this all due to the fact that between the halves, you spent no time in the locker room uh, pointing out errors that had been made, uh, right. suggesting things that could be improved in the second half, that you spent your halftime selling soft drinks and hot dogs in the stands? See, I have the concession out there at the stadium and uh, for the hot dogs and the soft drinks, like you mentioned. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> rather than talk to the kids uh, at halftime, you know, when they're behind 33 to nothing, there isn't really much you can say to them. No. They know they're behind They don't want to hear about it all. They just time. soon forget it for 10 or 15 minutes and relax. Sure. And by the same uh, token, I can be out there pushing them hot dogs and trying to make ends meet. So actually, no pun intended. <laughs> actually, you don't think that it does affect the, uh, the overall... Uh, team score in the final Well, I spend some criticism of my uh, being engaged in that activity in the newspapers. The local papers seem to think, they, one called me money mad. Yes, you know, well, I can see where they might. Like that, but I don't think it's serious. Well, uh, when's your first game and uh, who do you play, Spike? Our first game will be Pulse Normal. That comes up uh, next uh, Saturday. And uh, with all intents and purposes, we're going to show up for the game. All right, thank you, Head Coach Spike Sturdley of Indiana Collegiate University, and uh, we'll certainly be following the uh, record of ICU this coming season. Pull down the shade for ICU. Pull down the shades for ICU. As your back goes passing by, I see you fight. I guess everybody is uh, anxiously awaiting news of whether or not we're going to have the 11-inch gentleman here, and he is sitting right up, bright and cheerful. However, this time, he's asked that we don't mention his name, and I guess I can understand why. You did well, I had so much uh, reaction to the last time I appeared on your show that uh, my wife prevailed upon me to... Eliminate my name from this particular broadcast. I hope you'll understand. Well, that's all right. We'll call you then Mr. X. I guess that would be... That would be uh, suitable. I'll just accept that. Just to uh, recap uh, your story, you are 11 inches... 11 and a half inches tall, is that right? That's right. In stocking feet, sir, or those little shoes you're wearing? Well, uh, makes very little difference. The soles of these shoes are so thin that uh, I can stand on a dime and tell you whether it's heads or tails. Mm-hmm. Uh, you told us before that you were engaged in uh, a business of your own. You're very well-to-do. You have a special automobile to travel from one place to another. You lead a comparatively normal life. It's normal. Uh, 
the life as an 11-inch man could lead in this day. Um, I've been successful in business, and uh, I have a nice uh, family, and I have all the material things of life that any gentleman would want. Tell you, I notice you're shifting from one foot to the other. Why don't you sit down in this milk, uh, little milk container here and all just right. relax while you... <clears throat> uh, tell me this, uh, Mr. X... You've uh, been here in New York, you told me on the phone yesterday for several days. The top was open, I fell through. Oh, can you help me? Get him out of there. There, Thank how's you. that? Was well, there any milk in there? Milk on my uh, trouser cuffs here. Is that a drip dry suit you're wearing? It's a miracle fabric, yeah. Let's say that Mr. X is a fashion plate among our guests. He's always very well dressed, very neat. Right from his little shoes and spats up to his little gloves and tiny hat. What size hat is it that you do wear, sir? Three. Size three. Now, uh, I was going to ask you about this trip to New York. You're here buying something for your business, is that right? Well, I don't want to go into my business again, uh, Ray and Bob, or who are you? I'm Bob. Bob. I don't want to go into that again, will you? I'm here, supposed to say, on business, and uh, I think maybe if I mentioned what I was, what type of business I was here for, I'd tip my identity, and I don't want to do that. Well, uh, that's uh, understandable, sir. Have you any plans for a uh, vacation? That... No, I have adequate facilities at home. Do I understand? I'm not going away. I have a quite a palatial uh, estate. It's a beautiful home I have, and I have a, a regulation type pool for my friends, and I have a, a saucer. Uh, tile saucer submerged in the ground for myself. Yes, uh-huh. I wait around, swim. You have your own golf course, too, right? It's miniature, of course. Yes, it is. It has to be miniature because it would be impossible for me to strike a ball any distance at all. What is your average drive? Mm, 24 inches. 27 inches. I hit one one day, but that was right on the nose. That's a good one, huh? Well, I hope this will dispel all of the... The uh, queries that we've had from people, disbelievers, and uh, you have heard it once again, and probably for the last time. I hope we don't have to bother you again. But I, I do appreciate not. your calling us to suggest that you come up to clear. Well, it was good to talk with you again, uh, Bob. And uh, <coughs> Mr. X, will, will somebody help him down off the table? Now? I'll help him. Come here. Let's jump up into my hand. You're jumping up into Ray's oh, hand now? Fine. And Ray is down on the floor. putting him down on the floor, and he'll be... Uh, you're going to stay for the rest of the show? I say you're going to stay for the rest of the... You can't hear me down there. You're going to stay for the rest of the show, Mr. Ray? No, I don't believe so. I'll no. just be it out of here. Go back to the hotel. He's leaving with his little mincing four-inch steps, and that is quite a busy stride. There he goes. Webb, how are you this week? Webley Webster, ladies and gentlemen. Pretty good, thank you, Bob. And how are you this week? Uh, fine. We haven't had a, a book review. Ray was just mentioning to me. We haven't had a book review for several weeks now. And uh, I noticed the players have assembled out there in the studio. You They're all set to go with another dramatic episode of the book I've chosen to review today. Is this, going, is this a current bestseller or something new? No, this is an old classic. An old classic. It's took a driving grip of power. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Dick White. Certainly should be uh, appropriate for this. Well, that's what I thought, season. Bob, uh, being this season of the year. Is this the first time I... you've ever read it, or did you read oh, it? Oh, no, I've read end? this, and I've heard it on the radio, and I've seen it in the movies, and played the record of it, and yeah, it's... all that stuff. Well, okay, uh, the players are ready, I, and I hope that... Uh, it's we'll have one of the appropriate scenes. Yeah, so this uh, particular scene that we've chosen to dramatize, the way we work the players, takes place uh, about the third day at sea. Oh. And we hear the but there's no green old captain but where? call out for the first mate. But a shipboard. Matey, I, I said. Is that any way to be talking to your captain? We you like to mess up the wall. Oh, Taking it easy, Captain. I've lost the deck, matey. I came no. to bring the felicitations of the crew on this Yuletide season. Why, you don't know. Oh. Bring any felicitations oh. to your good captain, mate? Uh, you know better than that, laddie. All right, Captain. What me below for mess, mate? Well, we're having a roast goose for a Christmas dinner, Captain. Why, you don't know. Oh. 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 Maybe from now on, you'll be 
second with the captain on his choice. I thought you'd like roast goose, Captain. Oh, oh, oh. oh. What you don't you want like you it? thinking what the good captain will like. You better check with him first, lady. The storm looks pretty bad, Captain. Why, you... Oh. 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 Only going to suggest we all in the main... Well, that's about it. And well, I think that's that. probably the most exciting episode in the whole book. Well, I isn't... recommend it for the olders and the youngers. But that is... That is... Second a... purple problem. Today I is... Saw the... Book review, Dickens' Christmas Carol with the Webley Webster Players. An interesting story breaking right outside the uh, Radio City here in New York. Wally Ballou to cover it. So come in, please. On the street, Wally Ballou. Radios have some Wally Ballou here at 30 Rockefeller Plaza, heart of the radio industry in New York City. Chatting with uh, one or two of the passers... Hello, Eddie. With one or two of the passers-by. And uh, first of all, a gentleman who seems to stand out from the crowd because of the fact that over his shoulder is slung a balsam fir tree. Could I have your name, please, sir? Yes, I'm Matthew E. Deneen, and I'm from Rutland, Vermont. You in the Christmas tree business by any chance, Mr. Deneen? No, I'm not. I've uh, just come down uh, from Vermont to uh, sell this tree to uh, the Rockefeller Center people for their Christmas decorations. Well, that tree isn't much more than six, seven feet tall. They usually Five have one that's feet. about four stories high, you know. It's eight feet, but with a stand, it'll probably go eight feet and a half. Well, as you notice, they already have a big 75-foot well, tree there. But which, of course, that grows there all the time. I thought maybe oh, they wanted a Christmas wait, tree here to decorate to wait, give it uh, a Mr. holiday Deneen, flavor. That tree doesn't grow there all the time. You probably only come to New York for Christmas time. <laughs> Uh, you're not kidding me. Well, I know, it's, it's always there when you're here, but it's only at Christmas time. They bring that tree. They brought that one from Vermont and uh, brought it down on a big flat car truck. You kidding me not? What's that? I kid you not, sir. Well, uh, oh, that's, that tree is brought in for Christmas. Well, I think I paid a ten fishkies for this tree. I uh, thumbed my way down I, uh, to New York with the tree. And I just got off the subway now with it. Well, I think you're too late for Rockefeller City. You might try Park Avenue, although I think they've got their trees all purchased, too. Wow. They're about 20, 25 feet high. Well, it's beginning to fall now, anyway. I notice a lot of the needles are falling off this one. It That's looks right. brown, kind of. It is brown. I don't think it'll last until Christmas, actually. Uh-huh. But what do you suggest that I do? Uh, who can I talk with? You can use any one of the receptacles uh, that you'll find on the street corners for trash. It looks so as if it would snap up into small pieces easily. It's pretty... Yes, I think it would. It's Why don't you do that? Just throw well, it in the trash can. See, over. I was out uh, last summer, and I spotted this wonderful tree. It was hot in the middle of July, and I cut it right down so I could sell it. Well, that's the, the whole problem. Center people. Yeah, but you shouldn't have cut it down that. Uh, if you'd let it grow there, you might have had a chance that it would be green. Yeah. And that's the story from the street at this point. Radio's Wally Ballou thanking Matthew E. Dedean. You know, I have a, I've already been painted, taking it on the subway and everything. Uh-huh. Here, seated uh, at our Bob and Ray microphone at this time, is one of the world's uh, outstanding... Henry. Well, just a minute, please. Henrik, the first <clears throat> Henrik. Mr. Henrik Wadley, who hails, I believe, from Tioga Park... Wait, just a minute, Paul. Tioga Falls. Tioga Falls, Ohio. Ohio. And who has been billed around this country, and I believe in some foreign countries too, as the world's foremost impersonator of George Brent. Sir, you are a man about, uh, what, 53 or 54 years old? That's right. And uh, may I call you uh, Heinrich? Henrik. Henrik. Uh, how did you happen... Well, Henny, is, uh, people who know me call me Henny. How did you happen to uh, uh, take up uh, impersonations? Uh, were you uh, dramatically inclined as a child or what? Well, I wouldn't say I was dramatically inclined, uh, Mr. Bob. Uh, oh, but either I, Mr. Elliot or Bob will be I'm fine. I'm Bob. Uh, uh, you speak I up again, and you speak question. up just a little bit. I, I said, have you done impersonations ever since oh, yes, childhood I'm, or what? I remember the question now. No, and I wasn't particularly dramatic. It was just that I saw a George Brent movie once, mm-hmm. and 
I just thought I'd try to sound like him. And that could you could you well. give us a little bit of of George Brandt? I think the folks would like to uh, hear just how you go into this uh, in your act. Well, I say uh, probably you'll remember this scene from a great movie. And then this is when I do this. This is what you Brandt. do. Mm-hmm. While I'm home, anything new? I don't remember the exact movie, but uh, I don't either. neither does the voice uh, sound too familiar to me. George Brandt had quite a, a deep voice, uh, as I remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, have, have you lost the touch for it, or what? I mean, Well, I've been doing it so long, and uh, naturally, um, my voice... How many years have you been impersonating George Brandt? Oh, over 30 years. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I put a few gray hairs in my squash in that time, and my voice has changed. Do you do any other voices? Helmet Dantine. Could we hear a little bit of Helmet? What's going on in here anyway? Mm-hmm. Uh, That's Helmet. I see on the card here you do Claude Dauphin, too? Yeah. Could you do a little Claude Dauphin for us? Sure. Well, that's the way it goes, I guess, dear. So long for We've now. We've been chatting with Henny Wadley, the world's foremost impersonator of George Brent, with uh, a few extras thrown in to kind of uh, round out his entertaining. I want to thank you for coming all the way from Cuyahoga Falls and... Uh, let us know when your next appearance is. I certainly will, uh, Mr. Bob. Hey, Tex, you remember the plan now? Let's go over once more. Well, when the gold train comes up around the bend, we ride out from the underbrush here, jump off our horses, jump out of the train. No, wait a minute. Right away, the right away, you know, we're going to have trouble on that. We Why? have never been able to get off our horses... Slow like wait, 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 jumping off. Hush up, I think I hear it. I hear it coming there, around the bend now. How are we going to stop the train? The train will stop when we brandish our revolvers. You sure about that? Well, I've always seen it done that way. All right. Okay, here she comes. Now, we got to time this good. When the mail car gets right alongside, we ride out. You ready? You sure now? Then we jump off our horses, eh? Right. All right. She's almost upon us now. All right, let's ride out. Come on, come on, horse. Come on, horse. Right out, horse. There we go. Not too fast, horse. Slow down. Slow, slow down, horse. This is a hold up. Hey, hey, this hold. Jump Stop off. that iron horse. Jump off, hey. This is a hold up. Hey, help me off here. We wait like get off. Hurry up. That meal car is going to be fine. Wait like get off. Hey. hey, hold up, hold up. This is a hold up. Hold up. Hey, I got one foot off. Wait a minute. Let me get your foot in my steering. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm riding half your horse and half mine. Well, let me get down off. Now, uh, just about half of me is riding my horse and half well, of me is riding... Now, wait a minute. Who's... Uh, are you down? No, I'm just halfway down. Wait a minute. Oh! Well, well, it ain't much use now. It done gone by. Well, help me get back up on my horse here. Consign the dead burn luck anyway. We gotta practice getting on and off our yeah. horse. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Well... Come on. Well, I'm sure the sitting duck is uh, pretty close to docking now. And for that story, let's call in Wally Ballou aboard that boat. Ballou, in the wheelhouse of the sitting duck, which now has made quite a bit of uh, distance. There you go, 213. There you go, 213. Between the Narrows and the pier on the North River. All in two thirds. Two thirds now. Where we're going to. Land Captain Gibbs is yeah. still at my side and has taken over the wheel. What are you doing now, Captain? Steering. And you're going to turn, make a right turn up here. Is that right? Is that Navy lingo or uh, seafaring car? Any right, left turn? Yeah. No, not really. Uh, that's uh, automobile uh, lingo, so to speak. Uh huh. But. Uh, no, we, we turn the port or aft or starboard, you see. Well, now you're aiming for that little uh, pier there. That's that... the aim now, not the pier, beside it. Uh-huh. There's a little uh, body of water there between the two piers, and I'm going to try to squeeze the sitting duck in there and uh, let the people get off. How many people do you have passengers aboard right now? Well, uh, we mostly have bananas here. Uh-huh. But uh, we have uh, four or five folks who came along for the trip. They're all executives of the banana company. I understand that's quite a pleasant way to travel, and inexpensive, too. But the banana boat. Now we're in, I'd say, about 50 feet from the dock. 
Uh, what is that you're doing now, Captain? I'll take you a drink of water. How long will it be before the boat comes to a complete halt? Uh, as soon as it stops. Oh, I hit the pier there. Now, that's a mistake. Do they mind when you do that, the people that own the pier? Well, they're covered. I mean, they have insurance to cover that. But uh, they, they don't like it, no. They'd rather we didn't. Now I'm ringing the bell. What does that signify? Nothing special. It's something to do while I'm waiting for the boat to kind of wedge itself free here. This is the worst, Captain. Man. This is the worst, Captain. Captain. Yes, I think it's being on Captain. the air. Yes. I was leaning over the side. Uh, just as, as you brought the boat into a stop, and I was... Have the microphone. You better get out. I'm going to get out of here. I can't. I can't. I have my fingers not completely... Again, we return to Wally Ballou, who is, I assume, still aboard the great ship Sitting Duck. Come in, correspondent Wally Ballou. Wally Ballou, standing here at the edge of the deck, with my finger uh, still caught between the dock and the side of the Sitting Duck, which uh, pulled in here to New York just a while ago. Captain, what are the chances of moving the vessel so that I can... Uh, extricate my finger. Well, I'll, uh... There's no pain or anything. No, it's just a case of uh, being stuck there in the morning. Right, and, uh... It's yeah. kind of awkward to carry well, on the radio I... broadcast in this, uh... Shed. Man, will you, uh... Move the boat a little bit up there, please? One third. Yeah, back about a third. All into the anchor head, one third. One third. Right 15 degrees, brother? Right 15 degrees, brother. That should do it, because... You sure they're going the right way now, away from the dock? Right 15. Yes. Be sure you're going away from the dock. Uh, two zero zero. Uh, uh, oh. Wow. Ready to go. Two one three. Oh, okay. Hey, did you get your finger on? Yes, yes, oh. I did. Okay, you can bring it back in. No, it's All right. Any, much better. better. Any other questions now before you leave? No, I don't believe so. Uh, how's the chow of this vessel? So the food's all very good uh, here. But see, you have a great appetite. And uh, although uh, we had a rather hectic landing, I do hope that you and your great crew will pay us a call again whenever the sitting duck comes back well, to port. certainly hope I'm so. I'm awful sorry uh, that this happened. Oh, but, uh, forget it. Captain. I think uh, the entire crew is nervous. Oh, that's... Right? No. Trust no, me, uh, uh, you nobody's fault but my own. I should have had my finger down there between the ship and the dock anyway. Knowing that you radio people were aboard, I think, probably affected the crew. But again, thank you, and uh, we hope that you always consider the sitting dock as kind of a second home. Well, we'll certainly do that, uh, Captain. But it's been a pleasure talking to you and to all of the men of the sitting dock. Anchor's away. What? Anchor's away. That's so. No, I'm getting a signal to drop anchor. Oh. And this is Wally Ballou returning you to New York. Maybe uh, you've read in the papers recently, we're in New York, they had the talking mailbox. Well, that set us looking around town, and we came across something that we thought might be just as interesting. Uh, not far from Times Square is a talking soft drink dispensing machine, and we went there with our microphone. And uh, would you spin that tape now so we can all hear it? Hello, everybody. I'm standing in front of a talking soft drink machine, and uh, I wonder, sir, if you could explain a few things to us. Your order, please. Uh, well, what, what flavors do you have in there? We have imitation strawberry, imitation cherry, imitation cola, and very bad imitation chocolate drink. I don't even buy the last one. Well, uh, do I put a nickel in, a dime, or 15 cents, or how much is it? it it's 10 cents for each one except the imitation chocolate. That's 15. I see. So I would put a dime and a nickel in. Is would you a... repeat that question, please? Would I put a dime and a nickel in the machine? If you had it, if you want change, put a quarter in, and there's a slight charge for that, you'll get 20 cents back. You charge a nickel then for making change? That's right. 
Is it rather cramped back in there, sir? No, I'm a small uh, person of small build, so that it's not too difficult. Uh, what are you, from out of town or something? Yes, I'm a stranger here, sir. This is the first time I've been by this talking. May I suggest the imitation caller favor? Hmm. Oh, how much is that? That'll be ten cents. All right. Where do I put the money? Right over here? Right up there by my left shoulder. I see. Where's the soft drink, sir? Where's the cup? Well, you mean I have to bring my own cup? Naturally. It doesn't work unless there's a cup under there. Oh, I... Are we going to waste all of this imitation strawberry, imitation cherry? Who's imitation? Call her, sir. I know, but any one of the imitation flavors, you think we're going to waste them? Oh, well, I... Without a cup down there? Well, oh, I didn't know I had a... Three. Well, I'm not going to walk around town with my own cup, sir. Thank you. Learn I'm... the ways of the big city, fella. All right, I didn't come here to be insulted. It's been nice talking to you. Nice uh, to do business with you. Uh, do I get money back now? No, that's gone. I'm sorry. Uh, do you work eight hours? or? An eight-hour shift, and then I have a relief. Come on. Is he a small man, too? He's a little bit taller than I am. He has to kind of scooch down. I see. Well, it's been nice talking to you, sir. Friends has taken you to a talking soft drink dispensing machine. American industry on the march to Wally Balloon now in Harper's Ferry, New York. Come in, please, Wally Balloon. Please, blonde, blue-eyed Wally Balloon, speaking from Harper's Ferry, New York, home of the Waukesha Glass Fruit Factory, makers of some of the most beautiful centerpieces uh, that grace America's dining table. We're speaking with the president and founder of this concern, and first of all, Mr. Bosman. I think it's uh, interesting to ask you this. Why you call this the Waukesha Glass Fruit Factory when you're actually in Harpers Ferry, New York? Well, this plant uh, originally opened in Waukesha, uh, Wally, and uh, several years ago we moved it here to Harpers Ferry because it was closer to my mother's house. I see. And the factory has been here for some 23 years, I understand. Now turning out all manner of grapes, uh, peaches, pears... Apples, Spanish melons, Spanish melons, cantaloupes, bananas, watermelons, and breadfruit. Apricots, too? Yes, we make uh, almost any kind of vegetable uh, that you can think of. Uh, we've gone through several of the famous uh, vegetable and fruit catalogs, and I think we've covered them all. That is uh, the kind of fruit and vegetables that people want to have on their table. I was going to ask you if the trended uh, glass fruit and vegetables changes over the years. For instance... Today, are people buying as many glass apples as they were, say, ten years ago? Yes, people are buying more glass apples today than they were ten years ago. Now, you take this one here. This is a red delicious. Now, this is made like out of a... Like to look at that. It's a lot. It's made out of very... Well, well, you'll have to be more careful I where... I need to, uh, to drop that. It was slippery as you handed it to me. Well, like, uh... See, that represents a neat uh, paper loss now of almost $50 to me. Are all of these hand-painted? Uh, no, uh, not all of them are hand-painted, Wally. Uh, some of these, of course, are mixed in. The color is mixed in with the molten glass. Okay. And then uh, we have, of course, our highly paid personnel, the, the uh, glass blowers, who take this molten uh, uh, glass and to blow it into the apples and the bananas. I and should imagine so forth. that the bunches of grapes like this one here are yes. the most, most difficult to manufacture. I notice a look of uh, ash and horror on your face there, uh, sir. On my rugged features, you mean? Yes, I did. Well, I'm pretty it. upset about this, Palou. I think you can take your microphone and get out of here now before you spoil the whole thing for me. I All thought right. this was going to be a wonderful opportunity for me to talk about my products coast to coast. Well, it has I'll been. never, never realize in actual return what I've lost here today. No, financially, you have suffered uh, a setback. I've I... taken a bath. You certainly have. And this is Radio's Flawed Blue-Eyed Wally Baloo. Oh, I'm just taking my microphone out, sir. Well, through the door. Well, Bob, it's that time again. The finals of the Bob and Ray Annual Grand National Spelling Bee Contest. Uh, do you happen to have the regional winners there? Our three regional semifinalists uh, <laughs> arrived in New York this past week, and uh, I wonder if you would just step up to our microphone and identify yourself. You are? 
I'm Helen Ross, Fredericksburg, Maryland. And uh, thank you, Miss Ross. You're the winner from the uh, Middle Atlantic States, is that That's right? That's right. And uh, <clears throat> Russell Flume, are you here? Russell couldn't be here. Well, uh, Russell was the Southern States... Uh, but he got sick. Well, I know, but he was the champion oh, speller down there. Well, he, he, well, who are you, sir? I'm Benjamin Franklin. I'm from Altoona, Pennsylvania, and I'm going to substitute for him. Well, who do you represent? The Southern I'll States? I'll represent the Southern States, right. if I may. And our last uh, contestant oh. from the West Coast. Paul G. Revere. Paul G. Revere. Elmont, Utah. All right, sir. Now, you uh, two gentlemen and the lady uh, are the regional winners, and as you know... We're going to give you one round of words here in the first go-round in our national semifinals. If you answer correctly, in other words, if you spell your word correctly, you will hear. And, of course, if you answer wrong, it's... No, it's not that. That's it. Now, the words will be chosen out of this barrel, which has been... Uh, turned over, so they're all mixed up, and I think we'll let uh, our lady go first. Miss Ross, will you pick uh, your first word? All right. Add it to me, please. There you are. Your word, Miss Ross, is paleolithic. Paleolithic. Painting to an era in the development of this earth. Capital P-A-L-E-O. Paleo. L-I-T-H I-M. Oh, I'm sorry. The last letter should have been C, Miss Ross. But mm -hmm. better like next time in the second round. Let's move along to Mr. Flume, or rather to Mr. Flume's uh, proxy. Franklin. Mr. Benjamin Franklin, will you reach in and we'll have to move right along. Hand me the word, if you will, please. Okay, there you are. <clears throat> the word you have chosen from our barrel of uh, words is interfenestration. The spacing of windows. Uh, interfenestration, I-N-T-E-R-F-E-N-E-S-T-R-A-T-I-O-B. Oh, no. You missed by one letter, uh, Mr. Franklin. It was N. The last letter N. I'm sorry. All right. You'll take your seat next to Miss Ross and our final uh, semifinalist here. Mr. Revere, Mr. Elmont, Revere, Utah. Elmont, Utah. Will you hand me your word? Certainly. The word is the interrogative who. Well, wait a minute. Wait, wait, Mr. Well, Ross. Give him a chance. Well, please. I had the uh, real uh, tough I'm one. I'm sorry, but... So did I. Please, uh, you choose your own words, as you know. Who? W-H-O. Who is right. Well, and what so kind of a Mr. badger game Paul is this? the winner of round one. I get here Paleolithic. And semifinals. And he gets interfenestration. And we'll be back with round two who? in just a little while. And here we go with our second go-round, the deciding go-round in our Grand National Semifinal Spelling Bee with our three regional uh, uh, champions, Miss Ross, Mr. Revere, and Mr. Franklin. Like easy, uh, word doesn't mean it's phony our contestants are still it's bickering the, grape, among themselves about grape, the unfortunate uh, like the fact that they drew, uh, two of them drew hard words yourself. in the first round and one drew an easy word. Uh, Remember, for a right spelling it, and other. for a wrong spelling it. Here we go with uh, our first. second round, and our lady, Miss Betsy L. Ross, is first. Right. Will you reach into the barrel, which has been spun, to certainly mix up the uh, words chosen scientifically, and hand it to there you. There you are. <clears throat> this time, Miss Ross, and this is the deciding word for you, uh, your word is propinquity, or a uh, nearness. Propinquity? Propinquity. Well... well. How come he got who and I get well, words like that? You, you pick the word yourself, ma'am. Well, let's play the game fairly. I've never heard sports. it. What's it mean? It, it means a nearness or a... a... Propinquity. P-R-O-P-I-N. G. No, it looks like a G sometimes when... Oh, some H, people write. sure. Yeah, it's uh, wrong, though, the way you spelled it, so I'm afraid you're out, Miss Ross, but oh, our congratulations on putting up a good fight. I and didn't put up any good fight. I'm just trying to save my skin. Let's move now to the regional champion from the South, being represented by, by proxy, Mr. Uh, Benjamin Franklin. I uh, go along with Miss Ross to a degree. It seems uh, like she and I uh, do the long straws. Well, well you did get a difficult word as opposed to yeah. an easy one from Mr. Revere in the first round. Oh, I'll take Let's see chance. if you do any better this time, sir. Oh, okay, sir. You have chosen the word proximity. Proximity. Closeness. Closeness. Go right That's ahead. That's a pretty difficult word, too. Go ahead, Mr. Franklin. Proximity. P-R-O-X. 
I M I T. No, he was, he was going to spell L. No, you were going to spell it wrong. I could tell. Uh, P R O X I M I T Y would be your word, and that means you could tell he was going to spell it and wrong. Means, you uh, had that uh, the that buzzer going before West he Coast. got out two letters. If I don't West know what's going on here. Paul G. Revere can spell his word correctly. He remains. Four losers there, Mr. Elliott. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, they are, Mr. Revere. Yes. You've chosen your word, and if you spell it correctly, that means you. Uh, uh, are the standard bearer, the champion in right. our semifinals. will go on to our final round uh, later to be held here in New York. All right, sir. Where you have chosen is far, the opposite of near or close. Well, wait a go minute. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Revere, if you are will. Are you related or what? Please, Mr. Ross, far. Uh, be polite. F-A-R. That is right, and Please. I want to congratulate you, and I know Ray does too. You bet I do. For having... Uh, then, uh, well, tell us what you do, Mr. Uh, well, I have Revere. a, I own a theater out there in Elmont. That's right, and one of the most popular ones in Elmont, I understand. We're certainly looking forward to uh, you two fellows when you come out there in well, a we couple of weeks. we certainly appreciated the booking when we heard from you. Thanks for being oh, on our uh, semi-final spelling bee, yes, and you'll go along yes, to the yes, final, yes. and I would think your I'm luck will be loses. pretty good, Mr. Revere. Best of luck to you Thank anyway. It's been wonderful being here with you. Well... Wally Ballou is covering a convention this week here in New York, over at Fraternal Hall. He's standing by now, where he is uh, about to interview some of the uh, folks who have showed up for this annual National Marvin Convention. So come in, please, Wally Ballou. Wally Ballou here at Fraternal Hall, where we're speaking with some of the genial gentlemen assembled here in New York for four days at the National Marvin Convention. One of the uh, officers of the uh, group is here standing beside me. I wonder if you'd tell us first your full name, uh, Marvin. Uh, my name is uh, Marvin Lafferty. Uh-huh. And, and, uh, where do you hail from? Wilmette. Wilmette. But just outside Chicago. Anyway. That's right. Uh, Marvin, uh, tell me when this uh, organization uh, first formed and what the aims and purposes of it are. Well, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we first formed the Marvin uh, group uh, right after the... Uh, last uh, international misunderstanding about 1946 and 7 and we've been meeting every year <clears throat> since then. Do you pick a different city every year to hold your Marvin convention or? Yes we do. And I suppose you've hit some of the big ones? Des Moines? No we never did hit Des Moines we've hit some of the largest cities Chicago <clears throat> New York uh, Philadelphia Boston Detroit. San Francisco? No. Uh, Los Angeles, uh -huh. Sacramento. Seattle? No. Uh, Buffalo? Eugene, Oregon? No. No. Well, now, are all of the Marvins uh, here uh, present no. at this convention? No, they sorry. couldn't all be here. Uh, you see, the purpose, actually, for founding this organization was to protect the name Marvin from jokes and uh -huh. be ridiculed. Well, of course, we certainly don't want to make any sport of it because that is the purpose of your, your meeting here. It's a very fine name. And uh, I think you're accomplishing something, at least, by calling all of the Marvins together. Well, we get as many <coughs> Marvins as possible. Now, those with the last name Marvin, of course, are not included. So, that eliminates a lot of Marvins. But uh, just the first name. How many Marvins would you say are here now? In this room right now? Standing around here. Well, some of them have gone out to lunch. You want me to count them? Well, yes, they're here for the convention. You might as well include them. Well, twelve. Uh-huh. How many are out to lunch? Are you including the ones, including out, to the ones out to lunch? Including the ones out to lunch. So here there are about seven. There's about five Marvins out to lunch That's now. That's right, five of them. They're out oh. to lunch, and the seven are just milling about here. Yeah, and they have one lady member. A lady day, Marvin. Yeah. It's quite unusual. I hope that you have a very successful four days here in New York and that uh, you'll be able to work a little fun in with the business. Now, there'll be no fun. We don't have time for it. We're here for business, and that's what we're going to do, uh, Wally. And uh, although a lot of the Marvins who are here present would like to more or less go on the town, I just have to veto that. Uh -huh. We're here for business. You have to... Our meetings open at 8.30 in the morning, and we close up about 9 at night, and we're all pretty it's tired. Pretty long <laughs> day's agenda. <laughs> Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Lafferty, and it's been a pleasure talking to you and hearing something about this little note no, organization.
Once again, with the distinguishable measures of his theme, The Farmer in the Dell, it's time for the Bob and Ray Agricultural Director and uh, leader at the Lackawanna, New York Field Station, Dean Archer Armstead. Dean, uh, this being midwinter, I can't imagine what brings you to New York in the way of uh, farm program. Well, uh, Bob, I've come down here to uh, answer several pieces of mail, and I've received them at the uh, field station. The questions that have... Uh... And uh, I uh, thought I'd take this opportunity to uh, answer them on the radio well, and amount of money. I'd certainly be glad to go into any problems the midwinter midwinter gardener may have. Dean, uh, what's, what's the first one concerned with? The first one is concerned with the uh, uh, care of the lawn while covered with snow. Care of the lawn... Care of the lawn while covered with but snow. snow. Well, just what care can you give a lawn uh, when there well, uh, are several inches of snow on it? Well, that's uh, basically the problem. Uh, although, uh, just because the lawn is covered with snow, that doesn't mean that we should forget it entirely. But uh, certain things can be done uh, once the snow begins to melt. I suggest the scattering of seed in the later uh, part of uh, probably so that or the, in March if the snow is still on the ground. So that the moisture of the snow as it melts and aerates into the earth will carry with it the seeds which will uh, freshen up the lawn for spring. Oh, dry up. Let me now, let's get to the uh, second point here. Wind Our back. time isn't too uh, Moisture uh, of the air and the moisture of the snow. Uh, uh, I'll answer the questions. Uh, uh, this one mind. is a uh, trailing arbutus problem that a listener has. And they'd like to know uh, just when... Uh, would be the best time to prune the arbutai. Well, but this, uh, the time to prune arbutai would be, of course, in the fall. However, uh, it isn't catastrophic. Too late now. It, it isn't catastrophic if you forget to do it in the fall. You can do it uh, in the spring, of course. The only thing is that I would hesitate in pruning the arbutai as far back in the spring as I would in the fall. Oh, it's not, uh, not uh, quite as short as in the fall. I think we've bag. covered about as many uh, questions as we can, Dean. I hear your theme creeping in over there, and I certainly uh, hope that uh, your next visit will see the leaves budding on the tree, the grass sprouting through the ground, and your spring thoughts of farming uh, ever fresh in our minds. Down from his... Uh, rocket launching uh, center in Herkimer, New York, Professor Groggins, whom uh, you're well familiar with, I think. Uh, Professor, uh, what's new in the realm of space travel? Well, Bob, it's been uh, a long time since I first started uh, this rocket venture. I might point out, too, that it's the first time that I've been interviewed, I think, uh, here in person. Usually, uh, that controversial... Uh, man you have on your staff, Wally Ballou, interviews me. W.W. was uh, planning to go up to uh, Herkimer. Then we understood you were in New York. Now, is this something secret, or can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm uh, here in New York on no real secret uh, mission, my Bob. I'm down here to try to get more money for the fund I have. Well, this is the fund to uh, finance your rocket ship uh, to the moon? Which... I've run into so many problems there that uh, I couldn't possibly have anticipated. How much money have you spent so far, may I ask that question? Oh. Well, it's shocking when you think how much money I put into this thing. It's it's over $300. Well, now. I know. From Ballou's uh, report, you, you have the completed ship. Well, I uh, the problems that I mentioned, uh, I had to uh, tear up a linoleum, you remember, and put down tile. Yes. Uh, that was a thing I hadn't planned on. Uh, the motors, of course, uh, I had to uh, change. I found out that uh, the lawnmower wasn't strong enough, uh, that I had to get a more powerful generator motor, something like that. Well, now, here in New York, have you contacted banks or lending institutions? I've gone to uh, banks, uh, but uh, I just don't like being pushed around this way. Uh, I have to go from one man to another, and they all seem to wink and laugh at each other as though I'm, I'm kind of a nut. When do they... When do they start that? As soon as you say you're building a rocket, rocket to the moon. Mm -hmm. They uh, they say, is that so? Then they and wink and laugh. They wink and uh, they call over. Somebody come over and uh, get a load of this, they'll say. Rob, for if I interrupt for a moment, I think if I carried on the interview at this point, knowing the background of his experiments, I might be able to worm a little more out of them. Well, all right. Here is W.W. W. Ballou of the 
Bob and Ray's staff. Professor, the last time I saw you, you were loading the rocket ship with the special fuel. Uh, that's right. I'm awfully glad you mentioned that, uh, Wally. Yes, Sally, it's a pleasure to see you again. Nice to see you, sir. Uh, that's right. Now, that fuel didn't work out. Uh, I uh, thought maybe uh, solid fuel would be the answer, but I'm afraid I'll have to stick with liquid fuel. Well, by solid fuel, you refer to coal or coke. Wood. Wood. And that didn't work out. It didn't create the energy necessary to get the thing off the it ground. It created enough energy, but uh, I had to keep constantly watching it. Uh, I had no time to uh, enjoy the measurements or enjoy the trip, enjoy the scenery, so that uh, I had to rule wood out. I don't know whether Bob has told you, Wally. I'm here in New York, uh, going about to banks and lending institutions, uh, seeking money, uh, so that I can further this trip. I'm glad you brought up this point, Professor. Uh, what is the reaction been uh, when you have approached a bank or lending institution? Well, it hasn't been good. I pointed out uh, to uh, Bob there earlier that uh, they seem to think I'm a little uh, wacky, that uh, I'm not uh, worthy of a loan. So I've uh, you, pretty much given up on it. Do you point out your technical qualifications? By that I mean... Yes, a high school graduate. <clears throat> I, uh, that's uh, worth $49,000, I see, a matchbook covers. Uh, that's right. I like, uh, I like science. I read a lot about science books. And I think I'm quite capable of going to the moon. And if they don't want to back me up, then there's much I can do about well, it. Well, I'm certainly sure there'll be enough people who will realize the importance of your uh, work and will be contacting you in Herkimer. Well, uh, I what I want to get some money for now is I'd like to get a new suit. Right. And uh, I'd like to get a pair of shoes and I uh, thought maybe a haircut before I left. Swell. Uh, thanks very much for dropping... It's a, you dropped your copy of Disneyland magazine. All right. Uh, thanks for dropping by and our great wishes for success to Professor Groggins. Time now to check with uh, Bob and Ray's official weather forecaster station atop Mount Washington in New Hampshire at the uh, Bob and Ray Weather Observatory. If you're standing by up there by the microphone, Cliff, would you come in, please? Stations of the season to you too, Dale, and I must say we're having uh, very enjoyable weather. Well, Cliff, uh, I wonder what the outlook is for skiers, and uh, generally, uh, uh, what would be uh, your prognostications for the rest of the winter uh, preceding the uh, vernal equinox? What was that again, Dave? Uh, what's the weather? We uh, look for pretty generally good weather uh, for the rest of the winter. A little bit of snow, uh, some warm days, and some cold ones, too, I might add. How is the snow picture there now? The snow picture is uh, out of focus at the moment, Dave. I can't see uh, much beyond the uh, uh, the area of our weather station. As you know, we're situated in rather a gulch just below the uh, top of the mountain. I understand. Uh, affording us not a very good view. In fact... Uh, no view at all of the skiing area. Well, uh, well Cliff, I don't think we uh, planned it that way. Uh, we were to call on you... It was the time. best place we could get, Dave, right here in the gulch. Well, I know, but uh, we can't get a very accurate picture of the uh, of the snow and all, which is no, your reason for you being can. there. That's what Mrs. Fleming was saying to me the other day. You can't get a very accurate picture, Dave, of the ski conditions, for one thing. Yeah. Uh, from your vantage point in the gulch there. Where's the old lady now? Uh, she's away, uh, Dave. Uh-huh. And uh, has been enjoying a few days' uh, rest. She had that mountain fever, you know. I know, it comes on. That's right. But uh, the symptoms of that is what, you whistle between each word? Whistle or... <laughs> every few words like that to demonstrate. Uh-huh. Yes. But uh, you haven't had this fever now for a long time. Not for over a year and a half, Dave. Uh-huh. Well, then, uh, to sum up, the weather, then, would be typical of this season, right? Just about. Uh-huh. A little oh. bit of everything. Good. Okay, you were listening to Cliff Fleming. Uh, cut the microphone, please. You are listening to Cliff Fleming, Bob and Ray's official weather forecaster, stationed atop Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Here now are two of our musical friends in the world of entertainment, Claude and Clyde McBeebe, the McBeebe twins and their orchestra. And fellas, I presume you're appearing somewhere in uh, the local environs here. You're wrong. You're wrong. We are not, appearing, not appearing at the environs. Well, uh, just what brings you into New York? Usually there's some 
professional engagement that uh, brings you to these parts. Uh, that's uh, right. That's we are playing, a playing a in a nightclub. He just, just uh, picked the wrong, picked the wrong one. one. Oh, you mean when I said the environs? Well, I, I just meant that as the, the local area. Where will you be appearing, McBeebies? Uh, uh, we'll be we'll playing, playing at the Great, the great barn, barn, which, which is, is uh, in, Queens. in Queens. I don't believe I've ever heard of it. Uh, is that uh, Western type atmosphere, or uh, that's pretty popular these days, I guess? No, it's, it's uh, uh, well, rock and roll. Uh, rock and roll. Rock and roll. Well, that seems to be a new departure for the McBeeby group. I know last time you were advocates of uh, Sweet Swing and bringing back some of the old songs. You've changed then. Well, 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 we, well we have to, to, uh, to uh, get with get it. it. Uh, uh, we, can't we can't go playing go those la di songs and, uh, and, uh, and uh, slowly starve. starve. We, have to, uh, we have to uh, get, with get with it, so to speak. So to speak. Mm-hmm. Well, in, uh, in other words, you're keeping up with the trends, and I, I'm sorry that... Uh, well, you're uh, uh, keeping, keeping up, with, up the with the trends. Sorry you don't have a record with you today so that we can get an idea of the new sound of the McBeebies, but maybe in uh, uh, a week or two we might be able to uh, latch on to that. Well, uh, uh, he, he was supposed, supposed to bring a record. Bring a record. Who? He. he. You mean Claude? Well, no. Him. him. That one. Well, I guess you're confused. Uh, evidently there was a, a mix-up, one or the other of the two... Then we're supposed to bring a record. I'll tell you what, why don't you drop back next week, and we'll definitely promise to play your new style. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks again, again uh, Bob. Uh, Bob. And uh, um, Ray. Ray. That's his right name. That's his right name. Thank you, Claude and Clyde McBeebe, the McBeebe twins and their orchestra, for your musical visit today. Ray, is it time for our uh, phone call of the week to one of our friendly stations along the line? Yeah. To discover what the top song is. Today, we're dialing one of our neighbor stations, WTOK FM, in the great Green Mountain State. We hope to be talking with the head disc jockey there. The phone is ringing right now, in any moment. Hello. Bob and Ray calling from New York. Is this Franklin Barnstop at yes, WTOK FM? Yes, it is. Franklin, we called to find out what your top song out there this week is in the Great Green Mountain State. Gee, you couldn't have picked the worst station to call. What do you mean by that, Frank? Well, we don't play any records or any music. We don't play uh, something. You must have some kind of music of, of a sort on. No, we have a Star Spangled Banner when we sign on, and then we yeah, but every time we play sign records on. nowadays. Oh. No, you see, we're a hi-fi talk station. Well, what do you mean by that, Frank? Well, we talk all the time. We have uh, the mayor and the school committee and uh, professors and kids and people. We just talk. We have... Uh... I mean, there's no music on your station, no oh, yeah. or anything? I don't have any music. What are you, the head talker, then? That's right. I'm chief talker, and uh, I arrange a lot of the talk programs. Well, this is an unexpected development, but as long as we're on the line, can you tell us what the top talk show this week was? Yes, it was delivered by the head of the sanitation department here. He uh, delivered a 20 minute uh, talk on it. Wonderful. Okay, Franklin uh, Barnstop, I'm sorry we can't play the top uh, talk. I'd be glad to send you a tape recording of it maybe, if you'd like to. Uh, well, maybe it. next week we could it's about do it. 20 minutes in length. Well, and it's a lot of high pressure stuff in there. Well, it would be a little bit long uh, for the. Only language. I know. Well, thank you anyway, Frank, and keep up the good work up at uh, WTOK there in the Green Mountain State. Thank you very much, and good luck to you. A lot of fun talking to you. Give our best to the staff. If you want to talk for a while, come on up here someday. Okay, we'll Frank. Here. Right on. So right. we've made another call. Unfortunately, we didn't get a hit song out of that, but maybe someday we can play his record, huh? Industry on the March. Now to Wally Ballou at Dover, Delaware. Dover, Delaware. Wally Ballou speaking from the Furtive Greeting Card Company. And we're chatting with the president of the concern, Mr. Pauline Furtive. First of all, uh, Mr. Furtive, I might mention that... Now you can call me Pauline if you want. Isn't that rather an unusual name for Furtive? president of a greeting card company? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's our name, of course. Uh, it probably carries some overtones that uh, people wouldn't understand for the greeting cards. Oh, no, I met Pauline as a first name. What about it? Isn't that kind of unusual for you, a big, stapping, eight-foot, well, six-foot-eight uh, greeting card executive? Well, I don't know why not. My aunt was named Pauline. 
Well, that would probably explain Where it. Where I got the name. For family name. You go, I got full tell here at Furtive. And I wonder if you tell us just what you're doing. These are Christmas Christmas. cards, uh, and they're all printed with the person's name or names. Uh, We've ordered them. And uh, we have various, of course, messages and designs here, and they're all done in four or five colors. They're beautiful things to look upon, uh, Mr. Furtive. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure that the people who receive them, the recipients... I wish you wouldn't smoke in here. I beg your pardon. I'll put it out on the floor. Thank you. I am sure I can understand your worry there with all of this paperwork going on and all of the... Well, I hate to throw a cloud on the interview away. that way, but uh, it's something... I usually I do my interviews with a cigarette in my hand. Well, you're not going to do this one. No, well, I've put it out of the cement floor there. Right. Now, the people uh, who have ordered these cards will, of course, be calling around probably by the end of the week to pick them up, get them addressed, and in the mail. No, what we're shooting for is the 22nd of December. We hope to have them in the mail to the folks who bought them uh, so that uh, they have, well, three days to address them and get them out to their friends and relatives. So, well, I've uh, heard that greeting card companies work uh, almost a year ahead. But here you are working up about three days ahead of Christmas. That's what we're shooting for, the 22nd. Uh, last year, uh, fortunately, uh, we got them out on the 21st, but I don't think we can match that record Can't this do year. quite that well no. this year. You think that will give the people enough time to get them into the mail, much less have them delivered? Well, uh, my concern is getting them out to them before Christmas. Now, I don't care what they do with them. Uh, so long as my cards arrive at their home before Christmas... I'm happy. You're happy, you I get think. It? How about your own Christmas cards, Mr. Furtive? Have you got them all in the mail? Mine, yes. My wife takes care of that. They're uh-huh. all mailed about the 15th. I see. Well, it looks like you're going to have a year-end rush here, and then, of course, the slacking off period after the first of the year. But next year, the same thing, and the year after again and again. For many years to come, we hope. And our thanks for talking into our microphone here from Dover, Delaware. Well, it's been a pleasure having you down here, Mr. Ballou, and uh, I hope that uh, we've been able to fill America in on the great Christmas card printing thing. I certainly hope so. Now this is Radio's Wally Ballou uh, returning up to what? I just uh, talking to myself. I do that. There's a light on the table. I guess Wally is ready downstairs. Okay, so with that, then, let's call in Wally Blue, who's down on the street somewhere. Wally, can you hear us? And come Hello, speaking from the street somewhere where we're doing our regular man in the street program. However, it's a little bit empty down here right at the present moment. Nothing much but taxi cabs, uh, trucks, automobiles. And this fellow parked over here in a big pumpkin coach. It's a big, great big pumpkin. Can I speak to you a minute, uh, fella? Certainly you may. I'm just sitting here in my pumpkin coach. How long have you had this pumpkin coach? Oh, ever since my fairy godmother gave it to me. Your fairy godmother gave you this yes. pumpkin coach? Uh, yes, years ago. What for? Anything special? Uh, I, well, I was going to, uh... A banquet, <laughs> and I didn't have uh, any automobile to get there, and so uh, my fairy godmother appeared at the front door. You're a Scotch, aren't you, sir? No, sir, but sometimes my my diction gets funny. I see. And, uh, Go ahead with your story. I notice you've got a glass slipper all there, too. Glass shoe. Ain't oh, no slip- slipper. Slipper. It's a shoe. Where'd you get that? She gave it to me. She, uh, I had on a pair of old army shoes, and with a touch of a wand, she transformed them into glass shoes. Are you trying to make me believe all this stuff? Well, you asked me the question. I was just sitting here watching the people pass by, and uh, I didn't certainly... I am. Sure, come on in. Well, he wants to get in and try this. Sit well, I don't believe a uh, bit of your story. Uh, I'll have to find something more interesting to talk about. Well, goodbye. Fog, and I'd like to have a ride that coach someday. No, sir, you don't believe me. You won't ride in it if you don't believe me. Hey, did you know there's two white mice on the back of it? Yes, they're the footmen. You're crazy. Sure I am. Wally Ballou, returning you to Bob and Ray. <laughs>